Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to talk to you a little bit about epithelium. I'm going to just quickly try to introduce the topic. Uh, hopefully you've already had it in lecture, so what we're going to talk about is just kind of a brief overview uh, so that you have a better idea of what you're going to be looking at on slides. Okay, so let's take a look at epithelia in terms of um, their function first. So um, as anything in the human body, what you're going to see is very much based on what the function is. So um, one thing to always remember in the body is that form follows function. Okay, so basically that means that um, whatever the function is of the tissue you're looking at, whether it's epithelium or connective tissue or whatever it is you're going to be looking at, the function itself is going to determine what things look like, okay? And so, as an example, in today's lab, we're going to be looking at different kinds of epithelia, and depending on what their function is, you're going to see slightly different things, or in some cases, very, very different things, okay? So, um, as you can see on this list, epithelia can be used for a variety of different things. Uh, one prime example is your skin. Your skin is a protective layer. It is a barrier between you and the outside world, um, basically, it protects you from whatever is out there. So bacteria, viruses, fungi, um, you know, well, cold, I guess, but things like um, toxins, um, a variety of different things, like chemicals that you might be exposed to, the first line of defense is your epithelium, is your skin in, in many cases. And so as a result, it has to be designed in such a way that allows things like, for example, protection from stress and abrasion, okay, so scratching, things like that, cuts, uh, to some extent, can be um, just kind of blocked by the skin, and that's done because it has multiple layers, okay, so your skin is arranged in many layers, and it's also hydrophobic, and so in this way, it forms this kind of a protective layer between you and the outside world. Now, you might also have epithelia, well, you do also have epithelia that are responsible for absorption, like in your small, small intestine. So example, if you eat something, you have uh, cells on the surface of that epithelium that are going to absorb the nutrients that are passing through your small intestine. Okay, And so these cells are going to be specialized for very efficient um, absorption and transport of things across that epithelium. And so one way to do that is to make sure that epithelium does not have many layers. So you just have a single layer of cells in this case, and in this way, what you can have is a very quick transport from the inside of the small intestine to the underlying tissues, okay? And so this is a very, very different um, function, and therefore a very different sort of structure will be found within the epithelium itself. Some of the other functions that epithelium is responsible for is things like, for example, secretion, okay? So uh, the glands, like salivary glands, pancreas is a gland, uh, these are going to be composed of epithelial cells that are going to pr be producing components that will be exported out of the cell into some sort of a duct, and that duct will lead to either your oral cavity, as an example of salivary glands, or will lead into the small intestine, the duodenum, uh, as an example of the pancreas. Okay, so uh, these are cells that are going to be producing some sort of a, a molecule for export. Um, and so again, as a result, those cells will look a little bit different. They will have different organelles within their cytoplasm in order to be able to perform their functions. And so again, these cells will look different and the tissues themselves will look different from what you might see in terms of your skin, for example. Now you might also have uh, tissues or epithelial tissues that are responsible for transport. Uh, so a good example of that uh, would be the epithelium of your trachea. So the trachea itself um, is going to have an epithelium that is specialized for transport along the surface. Uh, so for example, if you have, you're breathing in something with dust particles, those dust particles will kind of get stuck to that surface of this epithelium. And then there are structures within that epithelium called cilia, which will beat upwards to take that dust away from your lungs so that they're not, the dust particles will not be able to get to your lungs. Uh, another example would be in the fallopian tubes. Okay, so um, the oocyte, as it's released from the ovary, is going to travel along the fallopian tubes, 
And one of the ways that it's going to be able to travel is because it doesn't have any form of propulsion of its own is there are cilia on the surface of the, the fallopian tubes which will push the oocyte along towards the uterus. Okay? Uh, another function is sensation. Okay? So again, your skin would be a good place for that happening. Um, there are some sensory structures embedded within your skin. Uh, another place that you might see sensation as a, far, as a part of the epithelium is your sense of smell, your sense of hearing, uh, your sense of taste. Um, basically, all of these things are taken care of by highly specialized epithelial cells. Okay, So, um, again, as you might imagine, these have to be um, structured in such a way that will allow for a very, um, for a very easy way of providing that particular function. Okay, And so again, all of these will look different depending on the function that they're supposed to be performing. Now before we can look at the epithelia as a tissue, let's really quickly take a look at epithelial cells in general. Okay, And so I really quickly just want to go over a few characteristics of epithelial cells. Now as you will see, epithelial cells look very different from one another. And again, depending on their function, uh, but they tend to have a few things in common. Okay, and so epithelial cells again that tend to be found in sheets, so it's a fairly continuous layer. Uh, and again, we're looking at interfaces with the external environment in many cases. So we're looking at places where it is forming a barrier between you and the outside world. Uh, now, sometimes that's a protective barrier, that's sometimes it's an absorptive barrier, but it's some sort of a border between the outside and the inside in many cases. Uh, but some of the characteristics that the cells have are a free surface. So up here would be the free surface. So there will be something, maybe the the lumen of a tube. Um, oops, lumen. It's an M of a tube. So if you're looking at a, a duct of some kind, okay, and then the inside of that tube is called the lumen. Okay, so this could be the lumen. Um, in this case, in this drawing, this would be a typical cell that might be found within the digestive tract, uh, the small intestine. Um, so the cell will have a free surface. So up here, there's nothing above it. There's nothing here except for maybe fluids passing across the surface um, or air or something that would be up above these cells, but there's no other cells above it. Okay, that's the idea. So there's a free surface. Um, these cells also have a polarity to them. Okay, so basically, what we have is uh, a region that is basically an up and a down and a side. So basically, these cells have an apex, which is found at the top of the cell. They have a base, which is basically the bottom of the cell. Okay. And then they have the sides, obviously. Okay. These are referred to as lateral surfaces. Okay. And so, uh, depending on which part of the cell you're looking at, there might be some specializations there. So, for example, at the apex, uh, what I've drawn is this figure um, is microvilli. Okay. So, these are very small specializations. These are very well visible under the electron microscope. They're going to be very difficult to see under the light microscope, unfortunately, but you will kind of see evidence of these things. Okay, So microvilli, in this case, here will be a, a form of a specialization at the apex. Okay, So what do microvilli do? Well, they increase the surface area of the cell. They then be found in cells that are absorptive. Okay, So cells that are absorbing things will want to pump things from the outside of the cell into the inside of the cell, and they want to do this as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible. And so they're, what they're going to do is they are going to do this using some sort of a channel protein, some sort of a transporter, and so these will be found embedded within the surface um, of this epithelium, on the surface of the membrane, and so you'd have these molecules on the surface, which will allow for the transport of molecules across. Okay. Now, as you might imagine, if you have a cell that is very quickly transporting things into the interior of the cell, that cell is going to swell up very quickly unless it's able to pump things out equally fast. And so quite often, cells that have uh, 
highly enfolded surface, the apex has microvilli, quite often will also have basal specializations that also increase the surface area of the cell at the base, but quite often also it will have lateral enfoldings as well, as you can see here. Okay, And all of these serve to pump things back out of the cell. At this, as fast as things are being brought into the cell, things are also going to be pumped out of the cell. The cell is not trying to absorb all those um, nutrients and keep it for itself. It's trying to pump them across the epithelium to underlying blood vessels. So you would have a blood vessel down here underneath this epithelial cell, which is actually going to take up these nutrients that are being brought in from the small intestine. Um, and they would then, these blood vessels would then distribute that throughout the, the rest of the body. Okay? So um, if you have surface specializations like microvilli, then you would also need lateral and basal enfoldings, which will, would allow for transport across. Now, if you think about this, uh, for a moment, um, if you think about this carefully, you might think, well, hold on a second. If I have a cell that is going to be transporting things in into the cell using these channels of some kind, these proteins of some kind, and if I remember correctly, um, the membrane itself is kind of a lipid fluid sort of thing, so if I have some sort of a, a protein up here. That protein could kind of float along the surface of this epithelium and it could also get in here. Right? So as to prevent this protein at the surface here, this transport protein that pumps things into the cell, so again the transport by this protein that's going to happen is going to go from the outside of the cell, from the top of the cell, through the membrane, and into the cell. Now again, if this protein is just kind of floating around in this membrane, what's to prevent it from stopping here and still trying to pump things into the cell? Because again, it's not going to reverse its function. It's going to still try to pump things from here to here. Right? Well, this is the thing. This is how we have um, lateral specializations which are specific. So there's a region right near the apex of the cell which has junctional complexes. And these junctional complexes, these are called zonula occludens. Okay, or occluding junctions. And they're basically like Ziploc. Uh, seals. Basically, it's like a Ziploc bag. Once they close, nothing passes between them, which means that if you have a protein, so again, if you have a channel protein that's embedded within this, um, within this membrane here, it's not going to be able to pass across through here. It's going to get stuck. So all the proteins that are at the, at the apex will stay at the apex. And all the channel proteins that are found pumping things out of the cell, for example, out here in the lateral regions or in the basal regions here, they will stay there simply because that zonia occludens will not allow them to float through to the apical portion. Okay, so uh, basically you have these junctional complexes that maintain this apical region of the cell and the basal lateral region of the cell. Okay, so again, just so that we're using the terminology, apical region okay and down here we have the basolateral region baso whoops lateral region Okay, so we have these two separate regions which kind of give the cell its polarity. There's an up and there's a down. Okay, now the other um, characteristic of epithelial cell is that they are associated with something called a basement membrane. Basically, uh, there is kind of this very dense sort of material 
that is found down here. This is the basement membrane over here. Okay, uh, which is a lot of carbohydrates, but also a lot of proteins. And so these cells in their basal regions will form attachments. They will have attachment proteins, junctional proteins, which will attach them to that basement membrane and maintain their association with the basement membrane. And the basement membrane itself will also attach itself then to the connective tissues underlying those cells. Okay, so uh, basically it allows for this kind of an interaction between epithelial cells uh, with uh, other tissues underneath them. Okay. So these are the characteristics of epithelial cells. Now let's take a look at how they are organized based on their function. Okay, and so one of the first things that we notice is that if we look under the microscope, we're going to have cells that have different shapes. Um, now these shapes will be dictated by the function of the cell and how active it is, and how much cytoplasm it requires to perform its function. So for example, you might have a cell that doesn't really have much activity going on inside it, so it has a very minimal amount of cytoplasm. There's just enough cytoplasm to basically hold on to the nucleus and a little bit just to have enough organelles to allow this cell to function. Okay, um, This cell would also probably stretch itself across a large surface. This would be a squamous cell. Okay, and so these cells, in especially something like a simple squamous epithelium, will be found in places where you have to have very easy transport diffusion of materials across this. Okay, so very very small materials, things like oxygen, for example. So, for example, oxygen will be able to travel across this very easily because it's a very thin layer of cytoplasm and membranes and so transport of oxygen will be very easy and so places like for example the lungs would have a lot of this type of epithelium types of cells okay now if a cell needs to be a bit more active and requires more organelles it might have a bit more cytoplasm and in those cases you might have a bit of cytoplasm visible not a lot in many cases but there's a bit more than you would find a squamous cell and then a nucleus which tends to be a bit more rounded in many cases and so as you can see here, what we're looking at is a cell that kind of looks very square. And remember, we're looking at three-dimensional cells, so it actually would look cuboidal, and so that's what we're looking at here. Okay, we're looking at a cuboidal cell, which would form either a simple cuboidal or a stratified cuboidal epithelium. Okay? Um, and lastly, we have a cell shape that's a little bit more enlarged. Basically, it's a cell that has a bit more cytoplasm. Okay? and there's a whole bunch of them together so they kind of get squished together after a little while and so what you have is this kind of a um, sort of rectangular looking cell uh, which is referred to as a columnar cell and so you have this, this is a nucleus uh, but you also have quite a bit more cytoplasm around it so I want you to notice that there's a lot more cytoplasm in this cell compared to a cuboidal cell Okay. Again, that amount of cytoplasm tells you something about the activity of this cell. Okay. So generally, the more active a cell is, the more function it has, the more organelles it requires to perform its function, uh, the more cytoplasm it has. And so, cuboidal uh, columnar cells tend to be a bit more active, especially in the transport of things ac across. So things like the, that epithelial cell we just talked about, that in the small intestine, that's doing a lot of pumping of things across. It's going to need a lot of mitochondria to allow that pumping to happen, and so you're going to have quite a bit more cytoplasm and so it's going to be a columnar cell and so this is what you're seeing here is this is a columnar cell that you would see here okay so let's take a look at how these cells are arranged into tissues so you can see here that we have two forms you have a sing simple layer so a single layer which is referred to as a simple epithelium and we have multiple layers which is known as a stratified epithelium. Okay, now there's also a pseudostratified, we'll talk about that at the end of today's talk. Okay, and the transitional is another specialized form of epithelium, so we'll talk about those at the end. Okay, so let's take a look at the epithelial tissues and how they are arranged. So as I mentioned already, again, we have a division based on number of layers, so epithelia can be either 
simple or they can be stratified okay so again those are the two different uh, forms uh, and then that is also subdivided based on the cell shape so we talked about squamous cells which are kind of flat cuboidal which are a bit kind of like square shaped sort of cells and columnar which are a bit taller okay and again the two specialized epithelia we'll talk about at the end so let's take a look at them individually okay so in this case here what we're seeing here is a simple squamous epithelium now I know it doesn't really look like it um, again we haven't covered anything um, besides epithelia just yet so everything on this slide on both of these slides kind of looks unfamiliar which is fine um, this week's lab is going to be a little confusing and again don't worry too much about it just try to get an idea of where things are just get an idea of some some epithelia at least uh, but don't worry too much if you're not getting everything from today's lab you things will make uh, things will make more sense uh, once we get through a few more labs okay so uh, let me just really quickly try to point these things out for you here. So simple squamous epithelia, uh, again, simple la single layer of cells, which are flat, okay? They can be found in places where you need to have very easy uh, diffusion of things across that epithelium, very efficient transport of gases especially, so very, very small things passing across, which tend to be very passive. And so what we have is a very thin layer of cells. And so lungs would be one example of where you would find this. You would also find this the lining of blood vessels. This is referred to as an endothelium. So if we talk about endothelium, we're talking about specifically the inside lining of the blood vessels. Endothelium is a simple squamous epithelium lining the inside of blood vessels. And so in this case here, the endothelium would be found in here, in this region here. So here's the lumen of the blood vessel. So remember, lumen refers to the inside of the tube, the inner space inside of the tube, okay? And so what we're seeing here are red blood cells. So these are the little orange things that you're seeing here are red blood cells, okay? And so the epithelial cells are just at the very surface. So for example, this nucleus right here is an epithelial cell nucleus, okay? Here's another one over here. Here's another one over here. Here's another one there's another one okay now you can see that these nuclei are fairly far apart the actual cell itself let me just try to kind of draw an example we'll probably go from here to here to here and back okay so that would be one of these squamous cells uh, again, let me draw another one right next to it just so you can see. Again, a very flat. Kind of the, the nuclei kind of just poke out into the lumen a little bit because of how thin these cells really are. Okay. And so that's why they, they kind of stick out in this slide. Okay. So that's the endothelium. All of this other stuff that you're seeing here underneath is a different kind of tissue. This is muscle over here. We're looking at a, a an artery in this case and there's some connective tissue beyond that. It looks a little bit different here. So there's connective tissue. We'll talk about this stuff next week. Okay? So just the very first layer of cells here in this case is the epithelium. Everything else is just other stuff. And again, this is why this week the slides may not make a lot of sense, but as you go through this course, you start to recognize what the other tissues look like, you will realize that, okay, this is not epithelium, this is epithelium. Just to give you a quick uh, you know, um, way of looking at this, uh, let me see if I can highlight something for you. Right here, I'm going to try to outline one of the nuclei. So this is a nucleus of one of the muscle cells that we're seeing here. Okay, so you can see the size of the nucleus. The shape is pretty flat, but the size of the nuclei in this layer underneath the epithelium is very, very different from the size of the nuclei in the endothelium itself. You can notice that the endothelial cells have much, much smaller nuclei because they are much less active. They don't need to activate a lot of different genes. Uh, they're just simply there as a barrier. They're not actively doing anything, so they don't require the use of a lot of different genes. And so their DNA is very highly compacted, and they don't need to be 
activating a lot of things, insulating a lot of cytoplasm or anything else. Okay. Whereas the muscle cells underneath will probably need to make some contractile proteins, they need to have access to a variety of different things, and so the nuclei will be larger and more decompacted, lighter staining as a result of this. Okay. Now, the other place that you might find um, small, simple squamous epithelium is also the exterior of a few organs. Okay. So several organs, uh, especially in your abdominal cavity, for example, uh, will need to be able to slide past one another very easily. And so the nice way to do that is to allow for a nice frictionless surface, which can be had by having a simple squamous epithelium. And so in this um, slide down at the bottom, what we have is down here. Again, look for the free surface. When you're looking at epithelia, look for the free surface. So right here, that's the free surface. Okay, So that's where you should see an epithelium. And right there, there's a nucleus. There's another flat nucleus right there. There's another flat nucleus right there. There's another one right there. Um, I want you to notice that there are nuclei above this as well. But these nuclei here are much more round. Okay, And these belong to these rounded cells that you're seeing here. What you're actually seeing here again is the same kind of mu muscle that you're seeing up above in the, uh, the first slide. Uh, it's just that you're looking at a cross section of those same cells. Okay, so uh, again, all of this here is muscle. Okay, just the outermost layer here is the epithelium. In this case, it's referred to as the mesothelium. It's the simple squamous epithelium covering the exterior of many organs. Okay, um, again. Uh, I told you in the first class that there's going to be a lot of terminology, a lot of um, you're going to be learning a new language. So again, these terms you need to memorize. You will we will be using them fairly frequently. So um, this is something that you will need to just memorize. Okay, endothelium is the simple squamous epithelium that covers the inside of blood vessels, and the mesothelium is the simple squamous epithelium that covers the outsides of organs. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So that was simple squamous epithelium. You can, of course, have a simple cuboidal epithelium as well. Okay, And so here again, what we're dealing with is uh, approximately height is equal to width, so cells that are roughly square looking on slides. Um, again, the nucleus is quite often round and often central, uh, but that depends on the size of the cell to some extent. Um, one slide that you guys have that I've uh, posted a video of is the thyroid where you have cells arranged into these follicles, these round structures, where you have epithelium, epithelial cells. And you will see nuclei that are fairly round and very close to one another. And one of the problems that we have with looking at slides under the microscope is that you cannot see the cell boundaries very easily because those cell boundaries are made up of uh, lipid membranes which do not stain very well with stains and so we're not going to be seeing the exterior boundaries of a lot of these cells so we kind of have to imagine some lines between the nuclei okay so just basically a C nuclei just draw yourself of an imaginary line between the nuclei, roughly equal distance between them, and you can say, okay, that's right there looks like the side, the height of the cell is roughly the same as the width. Again, nature is not as neat as we'd like her to be, so it's not going to be exact, but you can see here that this is roughly kind of square looking cell, so this would be a cuboidal epithelium, okay? And so if you look at this slide over here, I'm going to keep the green, and I'm going to kind of outline one of these. So uh, in the thyroid gland, uh, the follicle itself is actually filled with uh, material inside. So you're going to see this stuff inside uh, on the slide of the thyroid. This stuff is known as colloid. Okay. Now, I don't really care if you memorize the word colloid. Um, it's just the pink stuff inside, okay? 
Um, what I want you to focus on in that slide, though, of the thyroid is this epithelium here. So we can see the cells are cuboidal, uh, and they're basically they're producing the colloid, so they're actually producing it and pumping it into the interior, and it kind of this interior kind of acts as a storage area for this material. Okay, this basically is where the thyroid hormone is being stored, and when it's needed, it's simply pumped back across the epithelium to the blood vessels underneath. Okay, so that's for an example of thyroid. Okay, uh, what we have here and this slide that you see here is a kidney slide. What we're seeing here are kidney tubules. Okay, and so here's an example of one of the tubules. This is the outside of the tubule that I'm outlining right now. Okay. And so where I'm drawing the line right now is roughly where the basement membrane would be. Now, basement membranes are very difficult to visualize under the light microscope because they're extremely thin. Okay, So in most cases, you don't really see the basement membrane unless you specifically stain for it. Um, you just kind of have to imagine that it's there or just kind of assume that it's there. Okay, and so you can see here, and the inside of this tubule is a lumen. Okay, and so this is the apex of the cell, for example, right here. And so if you look carefully at these cells and try to draw some imaginary lines, you can say, okay, between the nuclei is where the boundary would be. So these cells are cuboidal. Okay, so this is a simple cuboidal epithelium. Now this one's pretty easy to see. Um, the reason I'm showing you this slide specifically is because there's two types of tubules here, and both of them have a simple cuboidal epithelium. Okay, so let me just switch colors here so I can outline another one of these tubules. So what I just outlined for you is a distal convoluted tubule from the kidney. And what I'm going to do now is show you the proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal convoluted tubule cells are much more active. Um, most of, about 80% of the filtrate coming through your kidneys is actually reabsorbed in these tubules. So these cells are very extremely active. And so right here, and there'll be more of this somewhere out here, for example. Okay. And so here's the apex. Okay. And you can see where the nuclei are. So again, we're going to draw some imaginary lines here. Again, some of these will kind of look like they are columnar, but in reality, some of these nuclei are kind of out of the plane of section or a little more in focus than others. And so, in reality, you really have, I think this would be an example of one of the cells right here. It probably would still qualify as a roughly cuboidal cell. And this one over here as well, maybe. Okay, um, It's just that it's much larger than the ones in the distal convoluted tubule. So again, this is proximal here. And the one that I did first is a distal. Okay, so those of you taking uh, physiology will know what these things are for. Those of you who haven't taken it yet, you will be learning about these soon enough. Okay, so again, the proximal convoluted tubules are much more active, the cells are much more active, and you can actually see that the staining is different as well. Uh, there's a lot less staining in the cytoplasm, there's a lot less cytoplasm to begin with, but also a lot less staining in the cytoplasm. Uh, whereas in the proximal convoluted tubules, the staining is quite uh, eosinophilic, so again, remember that term eosinophilic. Now remember that tends to stain a lot of proteins, um, and in this case here, it also will stain a lot of mitochondria, especially the mitochondrial proteins. Uh, because these cells are so active in active transport, uh, there's going to be a lot of mitochondria there. And so that's one of the reasons why you have so much cytoplasm is these cells are very, very active and have lots and lots of mitochondria inside them. And again, that's giving them that larger cytoplasm and also um, a much more eosinophilic sort of staining as well. Okay. So again, uh, both of these are simple cuboidal epithelia. Um, and again, you can draw some more of these around here for example again if you look around enough of these things you'll notice that they're probably more likely to be cuboidal or classified as cuboidal compared to columnar so again here's one cell um, here's another cell here's another cell okay so again 
it's probably a nucleus a little out of plane of section here. So again, these are simple cuboidal epithelia that you're seeing here. And by the way, all this, um, all these little red granules that you're seeing here, all these eosinophil granules you're seeing here, these are red blood cells. Okay, so that means that wherever you see all of them in here, there's a blood vessel in there. Okay, and so that blood vessel will have an endothelium, and right there is a nucleus. It's kind of flat. Red blood cells do not have nuclei, so the nucleus belongs to the blood vessel itself, blood vessel wall. So that would be one of those squamous cells. And again, you notice just one epithelial cell here, one epithelial nucleus, and that's probably going to be making up majority of this wall of that capillary here. Here's another one over here. Let me just outline the capillary for you. And right there is the nucleus of one of these epithelial, endothelial cells. And again, and most of that side right there, there are, you don't see any other nuclei there. That's because this one nucleus that you're seeing there in that capillary is making up the majority of that wall. Okay, So it's a very flat, elongated cell, but has a very, very thin wall. Okay. So let me just erase that so you can see that for yourselves. Okay, so go ahead and take a look at this yourself. Okay, so uh, let's move on to simple columnar. Okay, so simple columnar epithelium, uh, what we have here is a villus. So this is the, again from the small intestine. So what we're dealing with here is uh, epithelium that is meant for absorption. And so what we have uh, is a very good example of an epithelium right here. So the basement membrane would be right around here. Here's the lumen over here. Okay, and so right here would be one example of one columnar cell. And on the surface, it's going to have this thicker sort of surface, and that's because it has microvilli. You cannot see individual microvilli, but you do see that there's something there. It's a bit of a thicker area. It's a little bit more protein-filled, and so this tends to stay a bit more dark, a bit more eosinophilic. You can see it a bit more clearly in this area here. This is sometimes referred to as a brush border. Okay, and this is basically, it just means that there's microvilli there, okay? Now, um, one of the things to notice is that when you're dealing with uh, simple columnar epithelium, quite often what you see is nuclei tend to be aligned in the same level. Okay, so you have nuclei that kind of look the same, and they're all in the same basic position within the cell itself. So here is a nucleus of this cell over here. There's another one at the same level. There's another one. There's another one. So you see rows of nuclei within one of these simple columnar epithelia. You see rows. All the nuclei in this case here would be referred to as being central. Uh, in some cases, they would be basal, so it would be at the base of the cell, and sometimes they would be apical, which would be, means that the nuclei are at the apex of the cell. Okay. Uh, now you notice that there's a few nuclei in here that seem to kind of stick out as being a little different. Okay, and that's just part of the immune system. So these are actually lymphocytes; they're not epithelial cells. Uh, we'll talk about those when we talk about the lymphatic system later on this semester. The other one I want to point out on this particular slide is that there's a few cells that don't seem to have a brush border. Okay, and for example, this right here looks like a very empty sort of spot. What we're actually seeing here is a single-celled gland, a unicellular gland. This is called a goblet cell. The cell is secreting things, so it doesn't need to have a, a brush border. It doesn't have to have microvilli. That's not part of its function, so it doesn't have microvilli. Instead, it's going to be secreting things, so it's actually pushing things to the outside instead of taking things in. Okay. So again, uh, in this case here, we have uh, digestive tract, a very common place where you'd find that. Again, in the kidneys, you would periodically also see some of the, the ducts and tubules become columnar instead of just being simple cuboidal. The other thing I want to quickly point out on this slide is also that you do have some simple squamous epithelia here as well. So here's a nucleus, and here is the border of a lymphatic vessel. Okay, so we'll talk about those later on this semester. But you can see here, kind of a, a very thin outline, and down here 
or actually at the top of this villus, we have some areas that are kind of more eosinophilic. These are capillaries. So again, we would have some epithelial cells, especially if we can see one here in longitudinal section. Over here is a nucleus of a capillary found just underneath the epithelium. So again, this capillary here will be used to collect whatever is being absorbed from the lumen. So again, things would go from the lumen, be absorbed by the cell, and then pumped through into this capillary over here. Okay? So let's move on to the next slide. Okay, now we're talking about stratified epithelia. Now, um, the most common stratified epithelium would be a stratified squamous epithelium. Uh, the other two are much more uh, rare. And so, uh, what we're dealing with in terms of uh, stratified epithelia would be um, something like a stratified cuboidal, which you can see in this slide here, uh, tends to be found in ducts, especially leading away from glands. So, glands would start out as simple cuboidal, simple columnar. Um, but then they're going out towards the surface, and the surface is quite often stratified squamous. And so there's a transition zone here that you can see from, in this case, in this area right here, where there's a lumen right there. Here's the lumen. And then you have two layers of nuclei. So here's one layer of nuclei. And there's a second layer of nuclei. Okay, so you have two layers of cells showing up here. Okay, so this is a stratified epithelium. Okay? And based on the uppermost layers, you can see that, and again, you can see the same thing here as well. So let me just align the second part of that duct. Okay, where are you? There's my cursor. Okay, so again, here's the lumen. basement membrane will be here somewhere and again you have two layers of cells here so it's a stratified epithelium uh, and it is uh, a cuboidal epithelium just because you can see it's fairly round nuclei here um, and the cells are kind of you know about the same uh, height as they are in terms of width okay so that would be a stratified cuboidal uh, stratified uh, columnar is quite rare to see so it's going to be very difficult to really um, point that one out for you so I'm not going to uh, what I will do instead is go into stratified squamous really quickly. So stratified squamous epithelium, we're dealing with, again, always with stratified epithelia, we're looking at the uppermost layer of cells. So don't look at the base. So here, right here is where the basement membrane would be. And up here, the nuclei, let me just get the blue color. The nuclei kind of look like they would belong to columnar cells. Okay, and the cells are a bit more enlarged, there's a bit more cytoplasm here because these cells are fairly active. Uh, they are still not fully differentiated. But if you look at the surface, you see the nuclei are more flat. Okay, and that's really where you should be looking at. For stratified epithelia, always look at the surface to see what is the shape of the cells there. And the shape of especially the nuclei is going to tell you what kind of epithelium you're dealing with here. So this right here Again, is the free surface. Okay. Then, so at the free surface, we have we can see flat cells. That's a squamous epithelium, and you have multiple layers, so you know it's stratified. Okay. And again, you have stratified epithelia, and especially when you have multiple layers like this, when you have a fairly thick sort of uh, group of cells. You're dealing with a stratified squamous epithelium because it's an epithelium that's meant to, to work deal with stress, with abrasion especially, so scratching surface. Uh, so your skin, your esophagus, because let's face it, we don't chew our food properly ever. Um, the anal canal, vagina, these are places where you would find a stratified squamous epithelium because this epithelium needs to be able to deal with stress. Okay. Um, Whereas other places where you have stratified epithelium, like stratified columnar or stratified cuboidal, you have relatively th thin epithelia there, are two to three layers at most, really, uh, not much more beyond that. Okay, because again, it's usually a transition between a simple columnar or a simple cuboidal uh, going towards a stratified squamous epithelium at the surface. Okay, so it's kind of a transition zone there. Now let's talk really quickly about two specialized kind of epithelia that have their own categories or have their own special names. Uh, one of them 
is a transitional epithelium. Uh, transitional epithelium is referred to as transitional because it changes depending on its um, state. So it tends to be found in the urinary bladder. That's probably the most common place where you're going to see it. And the urinary bladder is basically a pouch that stores urine. Okay, When it's empty, it needs to be able to collapse. When it's full, it needs to be able to stretch. Uh, and so this epithelium allows for that stretch. So the cells here uh, are specialized. So when you look at the surface, you will find cells that are called dome-shaped cells, and you can see that here. Now, as you can see here, we have this kind of a dome-shaped appearance to these cells, which you can kind of see, you can kind of make it out. Uh, but more importantly, if you look at the cell itself, you notice that the cell is not squamous. You can see here the cell itself. Here's the nucleus. Here's another nucleus over here. So you can see these are not squamous cells. These are much more similar to maybe cuboidal cells almost. But the difference there is that they are able to stretch. So in um, when that uh, epithelium is stretched, when your bladder is full, for example, you've had a coffee and now you're sitting on lecture for two hours and you really need to go to the washroom, these cells no longer look like dome-shaped cells. Instead, they start to look a bit more squamous at that point. Okay, So that's why it's called a transitional epithelium because it does change shape depending on the state of the bladder. So there's an epithelium that is specialized and adapted to be able to stretch very easily. Uh, this is not something that the strat stratified squamous epithelium is supposed to do, for example. It's not supposed to stretch. The other epithelium is also not supposed to stretch. So this one is uh, definitely a specialized case. Okay, So transition epithelium has dome-shaped cells on the surface. Again, you're looking at the surface, so this is what we're going to be judging the epithelium by. And here you can see the epithelial cells are definitely not squamous, but you can see that there's a lot of layers. If you especially look at this image here, you have a lot of layers of cells. So it's not a stratified a columnar or cuboidal uh, because there's just too many layers, but again, the cells at the surface do not look squamous. So it's not stratified squamous either. So it's a transitional. Okay. The other specialized kind of epithelium is found in the trachea. I mentioned that earlier, I think, um, in terms of moving cells across the, things across the surface. So what we're seeing in this slide here, this is a bit of a higher magnification at the bottom. The basement membrane would be down here. So that's the bottom of the epithelium. Here's the lumen. So this is the inside of the trachea. And so what you can see here is there's multiple layers of nuclei showing up in here. Right? So we have at least three layers of nuclei. So you think, okay, this is a stratified epithelium. Uh, but the reality is that actually all of these cells are actually in contact with the basement membrane. Uh, again, you can't really see that with using normal staining uh, with a light microscope. Uh, but the reality is that all of these cells actually are in contact with the basement membrane. So technically, it is a single layer of cells. Technically, it's just the nuclei are pushed through at different levels because you have multiple different cell types here. Okay? Uh, one of the, things, the giveaways that might help you to see whether something is stratified or simple is to look at the surface because here you have surface specializations. In general, when you're dealing with um, stratified epithelia, again, I'm going to give you some general rules that doesn't apply in every situation, but in most cases it does. It will help you to identify things. These are cilia, so we have surface specializations. Where's my cursor? Here. Okay, so you can see cilia here. If you have surface specializations at the surface, it means that you're not looking at a stratified epithelium. Okay, so if you have cilia, it is a simple epithelium. Okay, and this is why it's called pseudo-stratified. Pseudo means fake. Pseudo refers to fake. Okay, so it's a fake stratified. It looks stratified, but it really isn't. Okay, and so the cilia on the surface here are a giveaway that you are not looking at an actual stratified epithelium. Okay, so uh, I will stop here and we'll look at some examples of these things in the lab tomorrow. Okay, so we'll see you soon. Bye.